Hello, everyone. Welcome to our July book club discussion. I have to say I am so excited to be here tonight, not just because we have one of my favorite people ever in life coming on with us, but just to be here with this beautiful community, our Friends and Fiction official book club members, where we hit 19,000 members this morning. Yay! <laughs> So, we don't want to keep you waiting because we know why you're here. Brenda, do you want to introduce our special guest? I would love to, Lisa. Thanks. So, <laughs> I am really excited, too, because I absolutely was um, just captivated by the Paris daughter. So, I would love to introduce um, Kristen Harmel, an instant New York Times bestselling author of The Paris Daughter. She's also USA Today and number one international bestselling author of the Book of Lost Names, The Forest of Vanishing Stars, The Winemaker's Wife, and a dozen other novels that have been translated into 28 languages and sold all over the world. A former reporter for People magazine, Kristen began writing professionally at 16 as a sports writer, covering Major League Baseball and NHL hockey That's for a local magazine in Tampa Bay, which I just find fascinating. That's so but cool. She is best known as one of the fab four our friends and fiction authors podcasters and hosts every wednesday night welcome Kristen. Kemp. yay hey, thank you guys so much for having me i'm so excited i was reaching for the books so yay here it is <laughs> kind of did the vanna thing <laughs> oh well Kristen, i just have to say oh the Paris Daughter was just such a powerful story. I mean, it had everything, grief and hope and resilience yeah. and tragedy and survival in the midst of unimaginable circumstances. Um, and before we launch into the full discussion, could you summarize the book for those who might be joining us for the first 15 minutes I, who haven't read it yet? I can attempt to, but it's so weird to be talking about the Paris daughter because I'm so in like the summer of songbirds mindset right now, you know, because <laughs> because Christie's book just came out. I'm like, I want to tell you, it's about some friends who go to summer camp. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. No, wrong book, wrong book. So um, yeah, so the Paris daughter is about two mothers, two daughters, an allied bomb that falls where it shouldn't in the suburbs of Paris during World War II, two families torn apart forever, and a storyline that picks up in 1960 New York, where the, um, the mothers uh, find each other again, and old mysteries are unearthed, see, unearthed secrets are uncovered, um, and things are revealed that will change everything for both of them forever. So that's kind of the Paris daughter, 1940s Paris, 1960 New York. Wow. And just amazing. Let me just say for those who haven't read it yet, we, um, no, it's... we will talk for a few minutes without spoilers, but at 715, we shift gears and we okay. will get deeper into the story but i have to ask kristen before we get too deep into the um the story itself um tell us about your book tour because i'm it's been a whirlwind i'm sure but what it was has been. what was memorable about your book tour for the paris daughter uh well seeing you guys um was obviously the highlight no i mean of honestly it was well and first of all i should say con huge congratulations on 19,000 that's amazing i just you guys just keep mm -hmm. growing and growing and it's incredible we were um we were talking before we came on tonight just about what an incredible community it is and what a wonderful community you guys have built. So um, huge congratulations to both of you on that. I know you put so much heart and soul into this. Um, and I think that's reflected back in the way that that the members um, Thank you. care about you and, and you so show up. But it's just, it's wonderful. And, and I am honored to be part of this community too. So thank you for building such a beautiful community for us, for all of us. Um, but so my, my book tour, um, it, it was, was fabulous. It was, um, you know, I, I think one of the highlights really was seeing so many friends and fiction members and so many friends and fiction book club members on the road. Um, particularly after the year I've had, it was, it was it, it kind of extraordinary to get back out there. And, you know, I had done events, um, in, uh, April in Columbus and in May in Charleston with Pat, with the others, right? Like the May one was for Patty's book. So I had seen a handful of people, but not 
not as many as I saw once I was kind of on a, a full tour of my own. And there was just something great about being back out there again, realizing like, I'm okay, I can do this. I'm, I'm putting one foot in front of the other and, you know, I'm on the other side of this now. And, um, and, and then seeing all of these people who had reached out, um, during my illness, during, during the time that I was fighting cancer, um, with cards, with gifts, with support, with messages, with just all, all of this kindness, um, being able to see all those people in person and, and give them hugs in person and say thank you in person um, was was um, even more emotional than I expected. So it um, it it felt um, it just felt incredible to be back out there. We definitely have such a great community. We do of people like I. Book people are the best people, book people right? People are the best people. You're totally, you totally right. are. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny when I said that in, you know, um, for anyone who doesn't know, I, there was a story uh, in the New York Times about friends and fiction, but it was an interview about me and my book. And I just wound up babbling about friends and fiction the entire time. So the article <laughs> ended up being about friends and fiction, which I'm super glad. But um, when Elizabeth Egan, the reporter was interviewing me, I said that Lisa, I, I said, book people are the best people. And she said, I'm not even going to write that down because it's so obvious. <laughs> I was like, it is, it is obvious. <laughs> so I we're all on it. the same page. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, we were, we were actually going to ask you about that New York Times article because yeah. obviously you knew it was being done or because yep. you were interviewed for it, but yeah. did you know how, what its focus was going to be? Like, did you know, like what, what were, what were your thoughts when you saw it for the first time? Um, well, I was very glad because, um, you know, we talked about a lot of things, but we did focus, I think most on friends and fiction. Um, but honestly, she asked me one question about friends and fiction and I was like, let me tell you everything. And like, I think I didn't shut up for 20 minutes. Um, you know, we, we talked about a little bit of other stuff. I'm glad I got to mention Bubba in the article. That was kind of cool. Right. One of our friends and fiction members, Bubba, she was, no, asking Bubba. Me, yeah, it was awesome. She was asking me, um, you know, if I had any examples of stuff that people had sent me and, and that was the first thing because I couldn't tell her, I couldn't tell her Lisa about the cup you sent me. <laughs> <laughs> I totally think you should. <laughs> can, I, can I share? Can I share about this, Lisa? Can I share that story? I think so I think so. so. Um, sure. You guys, Lisa very kindly sent me a cup that said you are awesome, right? And she just thought it said you are awesome, but it also says underneath, and she didn't realize there was like a little subtitle. It says keep that shit up. And also awesome is spelled wrong, which I think just makes it even funnier. <laughs> So it actually totally served its purpose because it made me laugh every single day. So it did it did far more than just a cup that said you were awesome. You were awesome. Oh. You that shit up spelled wrong. So you're awesome. <laughs> it was like a box of like different little I things. I know it was so sweet. It was so sweet. It's the just it just, just, just cracks me up. And I <laughs> and I saw it and then Kristen texted me and said, "Eat that shit up." And I went, "What? Like, like what?" It's in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, now it's what we say all the time. Honestly, it You're sits awesome. right here, right next to Eat where my little like, up. yeah, it sits That's right awesome. by like my little video corner. So every time I've been on a Friends and Fiction episode, especially honestly, especially during my cancer treatments, the day that I was not feeling like good you know like I, I just I was feeling like oh I'm not myself I could look over and be like all right I'm awesome keep that shit up and like it made me feel so much better <laughs> so thank you I'm so glad <laughs> oh <laughs> but no, okay the, I... the, the New York Times thing was really cool I was um I was really nervous about it I mean it, it you know they my publicist called and said Elizabeth Egan from the New York Times would like to talk to you for the inside the bestseller list column and I was like oh my god um and it was great we uh I was I think I was in Delaware on tour and um we had a nice long conversation and I really actually really liked um Elizabeth Egan the, the one who writes that column um we get along wonderfully she asked great questions and I was thrilled to see that the end result was something that talked about um friends and fiction because I think that's been the um the the thing I'm proudest of uh in my career right now that's a it's a it's it's a, a pretty beautiful thing I think that we've all done here. So yeah. Oh, that's so awesome. exciting. Yeah. 
the awesome with two E's, not one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, it's great. Like, it's that's awesome, Kristen. <laughs> totally awesome. <laughs> Keep that chat. Everyone's uh, everyone saying awesome I don't even know if I can awesome ask my series. I, I know we've gotten know off on the wrong me. foot for a, a book about like sad serious stuff <laughs> I know I'm thinking I don't know if I can start this serious discussion but let me start let me start with kind of a kind of a, a simpler one to get us rolling <laughs> okay kind of, oh we got tickled um first I want to just display the beautiful nest oh, of this you. book um for yeah, everybody okay. and I yeah. wanted to ask Kristen um this is an amazing um, cover, an amazing title. Was it originally the title or was it something yeah, else prior? It was originally the Paris Daughter. Um, I think I had the title very early on. And it's funny, I feel like it goes every other book. Every other book I have like the title immediately. And then the next book after that, I'm like fishing around for the title for months and months. So um, The Forest oh. of Vanishing Stars was not the original title. Um but the book of lost names was, for example. So, um, so it, I think it's like every other book and the next book I'm working on, I have absolutely no idea what we're going to call it. So following, following my normal, uh, normal trend of not knowing what to call a book after I've known one. So yeah, no, that, that has been the title all along though. Well, it's, it's just an amazing book. And we have, um, we have a book club member who is going to pop in Great. to ask you a question. And then I wanted to get to, because it has been titled The Paris Daughter um, the whole time, is daughter and motherhood is very important to your book. So after we let Marlene in, Ooh, Marlene. maybe we can hey, talk Marlene. a little bit about that to ask sure. her question. <laughs> see her coming. <laughs> hey, Marlene. Hey, Marlene. I can see you're coming. <laughs> where am i wait a minute marlene we can hear you there she is hey You're marlene good to see hi. you how are you i'm good it's so good to see you me too marlene nah. good to see you <laughs> i may freeze and not be able to say anything so far so good <laughs> I'll, I'll teach you a yiddish word i'm for clem Right. <laughs> I'm for Clem. <laughs> well, it's good to see you, Marlene. Um, I have I have a question for you. I've had an unbelievable number of thoughts. Oh, can, I can hear an echo. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Oh, okay. You sound great. Well, I guess my neighbors can hear me too because there's an echo, but that's okay. Um, I was wondering, in your research, um, do you think or know if someone you have interviewed, particularly a wartime survivor, has told you something they have never revealed to anyone else before? Ooh. A great question. That is, that a, is a great question. fantastic question. You know, that is a great question. And my initial thought was no, not that I can think of. But I think that interviewing someone as a as a someone who's writing a book about a topic or as a magazine journalist or a newspaper journalist, which you know, I, I used to write for magazines. I think when you're talking to someone for that purpose, it allows you to ask a different kind of question than if you just met somebody, right? Like if I just met somebody at a cocktail party and it came up in conversation um, that they had been a survivor from that time period, I might ask them a couple of questions, but they wouldn't be deep, invasive questions. They would just be sort of surface level, polite conversation questions. I, I think that when I'm researching a book though, and you know, and the person who is talking to you knows like that that's what you're doing. It kind of removes a barrier. So I don't know that someone has shared like a fact that's never been shared before, but I like to think that maybe they talk about things or have talked about things that wouldn't be part of what they would normally share. Does that make sense? Like yeah. if, 
it like it allowed you know it being in this position allows me to say how did you feel were you frightened what was your first thought what did you you know um I I do remember talking to um Herb Barash who I mentioned in the uh the author's note of the Paris I'm gonna bring him up afterwards okay okay great well you know one of the things he told me and I I he has probably talked about this before so I don't I don't think I'm the first person he said this to but we did delve in a little bit once he um in, into this once he mentioned it he had been sheltered um during the war he was a hidden child he was sheltered with um in, in a monastery I, with with some monks and or maybe i don't know if it was a convent or a catholic school it was something catholic and after the war when his parents came back for him because they both did survive and they came back for him um he told his parents that he had changed his mind about what he wanted to be when he grew up he wanted to be a priest now this was a little jewish boy um, whose parents had sent him away to basically pose as a Catholic boy um, to, to keep him safe. But he had embraced that so much that he thought, oh, I, I'd like to be like the most Catholic of Catholics. I'd like to be a priest. And, and so we talked a little bit about how his parents felt about that, whether that felt like, you know, he was turning their his back on traditions in his family or, you know, and, and he said, no, they were just glad that I survived. And they took me back into the traditions that we had, that I had been raised with. And he said, and after a while, that dream just sort of went away. So like it, his parents, I think just dealt with it the right way. Instead of looking at it as a problem, they realized this is something beautiful that he was attracted to because he was, you know, he was taken care of in this culture and, but he will find his way back to who he is. And, and he did. And I, I don't know, I kind of thought that was, it was an interesting thing to spend some time talking about. So that didn't really answer your question, Marlene, but that was kind of the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> um, I'm going to guess because I've listened to a number of um, survivors testimonies. Yeah. I was um, sometimes a part of or in the background when people were testifying wow. or preparing the, um, I was there for a little while the first time my father did it oh because my he, gosh. Um, my mother would practically run to, to be first when they just did audio, when they just yeah. um, did tape recording. Um, and she was sought after too because of where she was. Yeah. So people wanted to speak to her because not many people survived where she was. But my father was very hesitant. He was um, self-conscious about speaking at all. Yeah. And then speaking in English and then talking about what he hadn't talked about for years. Yeah. Since coming to America, except among close friends. Um, but I knew people who were doing it. And I met a woman who was um, in school at BU and part of our uh, one generation after group. And that was part of our goal was to um, enhance and increase the number of testimonies. And I went to my dad and I said, I know this woman. I met this uh, lovely young woman. She's so nice. Um, how about if I just bring her over so you can meet her? And awesome. um, he said, Marlene, have her bring everything with you. I know what you want to do. <laughs> 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 but she so was lovely though. she was and um I stayed just a little bit because I was fearful that if he realized I was there the whole time that he might not say everything yeah that's such a good point yep and I will say that I asked you that question because in later years every so often my parents would tell me something that I'm like where is this coming from like yeah I, I never heard this before and sometimes especially with my dad, there were a couple of things afterwards. I thought, I wonder if he's shared this with anybody else. Wow. And um, something he told me, I'll keep in here. Oh. That's where it's going to stay. It was his story, but I felt it's something that probably caused him a lot of survivor's guilt. Oh, wow. And it's something he, oh. I, I'm guessing he, you know, maybe he shared it with my mother when he first yeah. met her and so forth. Um, but Speaking of survivors, and I love how you uh, mentioned um, Herb Barash in the author's note, I read the author's note. So I wanna take out this quote. They, um, they had asked all of us, do we have some um, perhaps quote from the book? My quote is from the author's note. Oh, okay. Where Herb says, 
your fiction is truly the reality of what happened during the Holocaust. I say that in quotes. That's what he said to you. And when I read that, I heard myself. You have said that. Yes. (laughs) Speaking to you when I said that when I hear your characters in your book speak, I hear my parents' voices. I said it differently. So Mm. much. And he, um, I feel that he said the same thing. And Thank so you. take that as a, the best compliment from Herb. It, 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 mm. It's the best compliment from you too, Marlene. Thank you. That, that means so much to oh. me. Thank you. And I'm going to leave you with what I know my father would say about what you presented in The Paris Daughter. Looking back at the past, what are we doing in the present and how do we prepare for the future? Am I summarizing? the pieces of the book that's yeah I was thinking about that a lot that's perfect and I could especially if um my father noticed I was listening in on their friends reminiscing yeah and something sad came up and I was a great eavesdropper when I was young and trying to understand Yiddish (laughs) and um if he noticed I had a look on my face, maybe I was sad, he'd, he'd come over and talk to me. Uh, I can remember him several times saying to me, you can't go backwards. You can't go back in life. You can only go forward. So if you genius. wanna have a future, you have to go forward. And his emphasis was on, and I'm translating from several languages now, but his emphasis in saying go forward, I felt was, it's the individual's responsibility and energy that has to do that. And I felt that he, that's what he and my mother between, that's why they were a good match. They were good for lighting the fire for one another and saying, um, and then when he wanted to Americanize that with me, just to put a little smile on your face, I can remember him saying, if you keep looking in the rear view mirror, you're never going to drive anywhere. Oh, I like that. Uh That is so awesome, Marlene. Oh, Marlene, I've said this before. Thank you so much for sharing. I wish I could have known your dad. Oh, yes, Marlene. Thank you. I say with confidence, and I'll say goodnight, but I say with confidence, they're smiling down at you, Kristen. Oh. But continuing to teach, and I can hear my mother calling you, and this is the highest compliment, my Kristen. If she was talking about your friend, she would say, my Kristen. Thank you, Marlene. Aww. I wish I had known them. Thank you so much for sharing them with us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I'll be listening in the rest of the evening. Thanks, Marlene. We what a thank you, Marlene. Great Take care. You. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. That was so nice. What a what a wonderful surprise. I love Marlene. She's been, she's just she just has the kindest heart and she's been so tremendously supportive since day one. I mean, she's just, yeah, she's incredible. She's so sweet. Yeah. I was trying not to cry. I know. I, I'm I know, always so too. touched when she talks about her mom and her dad. Yeah. Very special. Absolutely. Well, switching gears a little <laughs> bit, uh, we did want to touch on this. Actually, before I ask the question, I want to go ahead and make the announcement. It is after 7.15, so we can do spoilers. Although okay. this question isn't really a spoiler, but depending on the answer, it may be okay. so. Spoiler time. Um, So female friendships and the bonds between women and motherhood are often at the center of your books. Why is that such an important theme for you in your writing? It's a good question. Um, And and I don't think I do it deliberately. I I think um, I think female friendship is something I really explored here in a way that I haven't before. I think motherhood maybe has been a piece of my novels for the last few years. And I think maybe that's just um, been a piece of, or maybe that is in part because I'm exploring what motherhood means to me, you know, as as a mother, Um, you know, only since probably, let's see, I had Noah in 2016. And at that point I had probably, I was probably working on um, maybe the Ruma and Ruwamali. So like from that book on, maybe there's more about 
parenthood in there because that was just something I was trying to explore myself, if that makes sense. The sweetness of forgetting, I think, centers around motherhood too, or and the, the bond between a a, um, a granddaughter and and a grandmother. Um, but that was more from the perspective of the younger party in that. Whereas I think now I'm a little bit older and I've experienced being a mother, and so maybe maybe I'm exploring that kind of family relationship from a different dynamic um, or from a different perspective. Um, as far as female friendship, though, I, I think I really wanted to write a book here um, that explored World War II and that explored the deepest bonds of love that had nothing to do with romance. Um, there was love in the book. Um, you know, uh, Juliet and Paul, I think, have a, a very beautiful love um, that kind of after, and again, I, I know this is the spoiler free period. So one last warning, anyone who's still here, who doesn't want to hear a spoiler <laughs> depart now. Um, but uh, after, after Paul dies, um, uh, Juliet, uh, I think the, the way that she loved him um, becomes something unhealthy because she doesn't deal with that grief the right way. Um, it, 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 so there's a little bit of romance but I think that the love in this book is not about it's not about romantic love that's not what the book's about and that was a real challenge to me I wanted to write something that we could really feel our whole hearts in um without feeling like love and marriage had to be the end all be all because it's not I think there's a lot of life to be lived that has nothing to do with um with finding a partner if that makes sense I love that I do too and you know what? It's I'm, I'm thinking of Elise and Juliet's relationship, and how in the beginning they do have such what we think is is deep bonds yeah. of friendship that yeah. that are family, but but it goes sort of terribly wrong. It and does. yeah, I just the Juliet's and again spoilers. Juliet's kind of descent into becoming unhinged is is a big part of this book and I just wondered was that was that difficult how difficult was that to write and to pace as you were going along it it was difficult because I didn't want to do that to Juliet you know what I mean like I liked Juliet she, I, I, I think nice she was person. she was a nice person um but I really wanted to explore how loss could affect you psychologically, um, depending on how you deal with it. And so Elise suffered a tremendous loss and Juliet suffered a tremendous loss, tremendous losses. Um, but they both moved forward in different ways. They both moved forward in different unhealthy ways. I mean, I think Elise also kind of clung to her grief and her self-blame and that kind of prevented her from living the life that she could have lived because she was very mired in that. But I think Juliet obviously um, did that to a, a completely different level. Um, so it was a challenge to write. I, I mean, I, I, um, I, the older I get, the more fascinated I am by um, just human psychology, by, by the way, by the way we respond to trauma and grief and sadness and hope and love and like all, all the things that come at us in life, the, the our response to those things determines our path forward. Um, and this was a novel where I really let myself um, explore that uh, and, and um and particularly in the case of Juliet, like I think I kind of took the training wheels off and let myself go full steam ahead <laughs> in, in exploring it, you know? <laughs> you know, that's exactly like what, what struck me is how you had juxtaposed grief and hope in this yeah. book. And I'm kind of curious yes. from our book club members, how, what, what did you see more in the book? Did you see more grief or did you see more hope? Mm -hmm. I mean, it ended with, kind of both yeah and yeah. so I'm I'm gonna let book club members you know weigh in on that while we go to the next thing but it's just a very interesting I, I'll also say while they're answering that I, I think that grief and hope um live side by side you know what yep. I mean they're um, hand in hand they're hand in hand I I mean I I, I think um I think that's the only way to emerge from grief is, is yep. to grasp on to a little bit of hope for something, for the future, for 
for someone else's happiness for, you, you know, it, it, hope for something I think is sometimes the way yeah. out of grief. Um, so I'll be curious too, to see what their, what, what the people who are watching what their response is. But, um, uh, I, I do think the two go together in a lot of ways. I agree. They do and, and they're, they're both in, you know, Elise approached her grief a, a lot differently than Juliet. And, and in the end, you know, I, I think that was a fundamental aspect of what happened to both of them. So I just, um, also wanted to, well, let me stop there. Lisa, did we have any, do we well, there's have There's a any? bit of a delay there. They're starting to oh, I'm come sorry. in, but um, the majority of people are saying, like Molly says, I was just thinking the same. You can't have the good hope without yeah. the bad. Um, Bubba says, yes, hope always. Nicole says, I saw both, but also saw how we can't deal with these struggles on our own yeah. and both needed support, but didn't have it. Yep. Um, Leah says, hope is how you can get through and survive grief. And Maria says, I agree. They do go together. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. I'm, I'm glad. And Jeff says, hope and this, hope this and Wade Rouse's book, Edge of Summer, helped me deal with my loss of my mom. Oh. My mom passed this February. We're so sorry for your loss, oh, Jeff. We are so sorry. You know, Je um, Jeff was at my um, my event in Rehoboth Beach with Wade and got to tell him that in person, oh. which was really nice. I, I think that meant a lot to Wade to hear that too. Yeah. Um, yep, hope and grief hand in hand is hope the overall consensus, I think. Yeah. It's hard yeah. to pick one. Yeah, that's very true. Good point. Yeah. Kristen, I was curious too about what there there's a big um component of creativity in the book too with the expressions of art. Yeah. Um how important was that to the story? Well, obviously it was important to the story, but you you demonstrated it in several different ways. Well, you know, I, I really liked the idea of making Elise a woodcarver um, for a few reasons. Um, something different, first of all, right? Like I, I, I had written, I actually knew from the beginning um, that I wanted her to be an artist because I wanted her to have some place to channel her grief. Um, and to find hope, right? So we were just talking about grief and hope. Like that that was a big place where Elise put her pain, right? Like she was able to kind of work that out through uh, creative expression. But it occurred to me as I began writing the book that I'd already written a book about painters. Um, when when uh, The book When We Meet Again has a painter as a main character. So I was like, oh, I guess I could do that again because it would be totally different. But like, I feel like I shouldn't. And in looking around for a different art form, I felt very drawn to wood carving because to me, there was something really cool about the fact that wood was once alive, right? And you're taking a piece of wood that was once living and is not living anymore. And you're giving it new life in a completely different way. And I thought there was a lot of symbolism in that, that really tied into kind of what the kind of tied into the journey that the characters were on. So it, I think, Art was important from a symbolic perspective, at, like from a, on a like a big literary writerly level. But then on the page, I think it was really an important thread that ran through Elise's life um, as sort of a lifeline. Um, it was something that she had before she kind of lost herself in her marriage. Um, and then after she had suffered the loss of her husband and the loss of her child, um, she found her way back through that lifeline that had always been there. I think because when you have that kind of creative outlet, um, even if you set it to the side for a little while, it never really leaves you if it's something that you're passionate about. And she rediscovered that passion and found her way back. So, um, so I liked letting her do that through art in, in the book too. I loved the, <laughs> I loved all of the art in the book. I love that she was a wood carver. I thought that was so unique and different. Thank you. Um, and our chat or members in the chat are saying the same thing. Thank so you. I have an advanced question okay. from Lisa Bland. And okay. she says, 
my friend Kristen and I had two. Oh, Lisa and Kristen. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> it's us. <laughs> <laughs> my friend Kristen and I had too quick of a chat about this fantastic book and speculated about Bernard. There seemed to be so much more to explore with his character and what happened to him. We were especially curious as to what was Bernard's backstory and if he might appear in an upcoming book. Ooh, I actually have not thought of that. No one has asked me that about Bernard yet. Um, <laughs> no, I, I don't have any plans immediately to put him in an upcoming book, but you never know. It, I mean, it was kind of great to return to Orignon, the town where we see where a lot of the Book of Lost Names takes place. Um, and that is where Bernard is. So I could see writing about him in the future. And although that had not been my plan, but now my wheels are spinning. <laughs> and maybe. Um, so it's you interesting. It in, exactly. That's right. In my first draft of the story, Bernard was um, played a little bit of a bigger role. Um, because in my first draft of the story, I had him sort of having um, a romantic relationship with Elise um, while she was, Ooh. while she was there in Orignol. Um, you know, because her husband has died, right? She knows her husband is dead. She's all by herself. And I wasn't thinking of it like, oh, not, like now this is going to be this great romantic future for Elise. I was thinking of it as something very realistic that you might do if you were in such pain. I mean, she was trying, yes. she, you know, she was terrified about what was happening to her daughter. She was, you know, grieving having to have, you know, left her behind. Like, I think she was so upside down and so inside out. Um, and I think in my mind and on the page in that first draft, Bernard was someone who had had a lot of loss too. Um, he had lost his family and he was, you know, kind of a shell of who he had once been. Like he was a good man who had sort of was doing the right thing, but had like lost touch with who he was. And there was something that felt right to me about he and Elise being together during that time. But as soon as the war ended, the two of them going their separate ways amicably, like both of them understanding that it wasn't anything other than a way to ease their pain. Does that make sense? So yeah, that, was, that was on the page in the first draft. And my editor just thought that it made things too muddy, like that it was just unnecessary to have, you know, like, yes, that might have been realistic to have done, but like it didn't belong in the in the book if that made sense so like it, it it so yeah so that that was kind of Bernard's backstory a little bit more um but yeah that didn't wind up in the final um Very oh actually and I'm glad that you uh, you asked me that because you reminded me the number one question I get from people emailing to me and I don't always answer just because I haven't had a chance to go back through all my emails so if you out there have emailed me and I have not answered you here's the answer to the question I know you yes. asked because so <laughs> many people have asked me uh, um, I've had a lot of people ask why Jack Fitzgerald looks familiar to Elise when she first sees him. So Jack Fitzgerald yep. is the gallery owner in New York. And, um, and I've actually had a couple of people say, well, he looks familiar to Juliet too. Well, he looks familiar to Juliet because he's the gallery owner who works down the block from her. So she's seen him, but hasn't talked to him. So that's nothing mysterious, but as for why he looks familiar to Elise, this was also something that was part of the first draft that we took out, but that I still wanted to keep a little bit in, um, in the first draft, I had, I had it that, so, okay, so you remember that she meets her husband, Olivier, um, in New York, she, you know, he kind of mm -hmm. sweeps her off her feet, she goes to Paris with him, and then immediately kind of puts all of her needs and all of her personality aside to mm -hmm. give the spotlight to him, right? So because he's, she just, she, she makes the mistake that so many people make when they're young, which is pushing your own needs to the background to become somebody who you think this like glamorous, wonderful person wants you to be, right? Like who among us has yeah. not made that, that mistake in an early young relationship, whether we were teenagers mm -hmm. or early twenties, right? I know I have. Um, I, in my mind, Jack Fitzgerald was somebody who also knew Elise from her years as an at, at being an artist in New York, because he was an artist too. He came up in the same art scene that she did. Um, and in the first draft of the book, he was someone who had loved her before she left for France um, and never thought he would see her again. Like loved her in the way you do in your twenties and then, you know, moved on with his life. It's not like he was carrying a flame for her all these years. But when she comes back into his life, um, it, it was kind of like fate coming 
back around. Um, and my editor felt like that was too many coincidences. She just said like, well, what are the odds they would come back into each other's orbit? I was like, well, they're really good because they're both like in this very small art scene. And she was like, eh, and I was like, come on. And she was like, eh. And um, even when I disagree, my editor honestly is always right. She's the, it's the same editor I've worked with since uh, 2010 when we sold her The Sweetness of Forgetting. She wow. is one of my favorite people in the That's world. Awesome. She has great instincts and she always sees stuff about my books that like I'm blind to when I'm in the middle of it. So even though I felt pretty strongly about that and I wanted that to be a storyline, um, I was like, okay, like if you if it feels wrong to you, then we will take it out. And I said, but in my mind, Jack was someone who was a part of her past at some point. So I want to leave, like, even if they just glimpsed each other across the room at like an artist's meeting, um, you know, back in the 1930s, because it very much made sense that they would have been part of the same artist community in New York in the 1930s before she left. Um, and so that's why I left that little piece in. But um, clearly that, that was a mistake because I have um, received more emails about why Jack Fitzgerald looks familiar than I have received about anything in my entire career <laughs> well we so. had a couple members ask that so i'm glad that you addressed that too so now you yeah. guys well, you know, for us. now you know now you know yeah <laughs> but it's kind of nice though it's a little mysterious yep you know yeah. and i also think hasn't that has that ever happened to you like that has happened to me where i have met somebody and i'm like I know we've never met, but like there is something so familiar about you and yeah. they've wound up becoming a part of my life. And it felt like they were supposed to be there all along. So like, to me, that was very much a thing. I mean, my, um, yeah. my, my film manager, for example, Jonathan, like from the moment we first had, I, and I met him over zoom, like we were introduced by my, my film agent, long story, but from the moment we started talking, like, it was like, he was like my long lost cousin or something. I mean, it was just a familiarity that we shouldn't have had. And we have continued to mesh so well like that. And I just think that happens sometimes with the people who yeah. are supposed to be in your life. And so that was a little bit of it for me too, with Elise. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm so glad that you shared that. <laughs> I really am. That's a great story. Thanks. Um, I have one more question, advanced question. Sure. Um, Jennifer would like to know, where did you get the idea of Juliet recreating the bookstore as the only way she can live? Ooh, I just liked, I liked the symbolism of that. I, I liked, I liked the idea that somebody who's so lost to grief that she has mm -hmm. completely rewritten the story of her life in her head. I mean, again, this is a huge spoiler, uh, but I'm hoping everybody here has read the book. Um, if you have deluded yourself to such a degree that you believe that, that yeah, the, the, the person who's living with you is a different person, um, th then I think you could convince yourself of anything. And, and I think to me, in order for... Juliet to have made that leap to believe that to really let herself believe that she had to make all the other leaps in, in, in between and and to me that involved um trying to recreate the past in the way she knew how and, and I liked the idea also of Elise of Elise and Ruth stumbling upon this bookshop and and it, I mean it, it was the physical embodiment of everything of, of how wrong Juliet's life had gone. You, you know what I mean? Like one look at that and you realize like she's completely off the deep end. Right. I mean, I, I don't know. It was just, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Even when it terrified, well, I shouldn't say terrified, but terrifies her daughter. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yep, would be daughter. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. You know, that was the most amazing thing to me. I mean, I could see where, yeah. you know, there is there is the symbolism of stories coming to life and she could keep yeah. her her yes. story living as long as the bookstore existed. But to do that, yeah. oh, my goodness, mm -hmm. it was just amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we have another uh, guest popping in book Ooh. club member to ask Yay. you a question. Great. And so I'm bringing her in now. That would Yay. be Anissa. Hey, Anissa. 
Uh, and you never know what an ACES photo is going to be. I know, be. exactly. Yeah. Some fun <laughs> author events. <laughs> she was with Christy hey. today. Oh, great. Hey, so, Anissa, how are you? Hey. Fine, how are you? It's not let me put my camera on. Just one sec. Okay. There you are. Oh, well, no, I, I was. Take us out. Oh, okay. there, there, there you, you are. Hey, Anissa, good to see you. Hey, how are y'all doing? Good, how about you? Good. Great, thanks. I've been, Christy had lunch at M. Judson, and then oh. I went up to Hendersonville to the library up there to, in North Carolina. So oh, I did two events with her today. Oh, yeah. wow. How was her, how was the luncheon? Very I nice. Love, I love sold, sold out, beyond sold out. They were basically trying to put people on top of people if they could. Oh. Was, <laughs> she sold out quickly, you know, and she didn't get a chance to do the double did, like you yeah. did. So she didn't yeah. get to double, double, you know. But it, it, it was really good. And she had a nice crowd up in um, Hendersonville. Oh, great. Good that's a nice her. library. But I don't think you've done that one before, Kristen. But that's really I, I, I don't think there. I have either. Was, was Christy still celebrating her birthday? She was. She was. <laughs> we, we took some stuff to her yesterday. She did the Gaffney Library yesterday, yeah. which it was only open for the event. And um, Linda took her some balloons. And I had taken her a sash and a, a oh, little birthday nice. hat. And oh, some, is that from you? I think I saw that in her video. That was cute. Yeah. Yeah, she and she had a pen and she had some sunglasses. We we um did, wanted to make sure that you know she got to celebrate her birthday. Oh, that was sweet. She was on the road. So that was nice. Thank you. Oh, oh you're welcome. That's so sweet. Yeah. Well, Anissa, I I think you had you had a really interesting question yeah. for Kristen. Okay. So um Kristen, what I was interested in, so I, um my my Kindle is just full of highlighted and highlighted quotes, oh, but right. one that really stood out to me was on um it's on page it's on 327. I'm pretty sure the book and the Kindle is the same, but it might not be. But um, Ruth is actually talking to Elise. And it's, um, even if life transforms us, we are all who we are at the core our whole lives through. So I'm curious, so this is a two-part question. So I'm curious, um, I'm guessing you probably wrote this about two years ago. So what did that, what did that quote mean to you at that point? And what does that quote mean to you now, if it means anything differently since what you've gone through the last nine, 10 months? Um, that is a great question. And I think the answer is that it's a, something I believed strongly a couple of years ago. And that belief has only grown since then, because I think that, I think when we face a difficult time, if we face it head on, and with our eyes wide open, um, it, in other words, not burying our head in the sand, not trying to hide from it, like trying to do what we can to face it and, and therefore grow from it. Um, I think we become a better, stronger version of who we always were. Um, which is not to say that I was exactly the same person a year ago, um, before my cancer diagnosis. Um, but I think that just like that quote said, I, I was, I've always been me at my core. I've just, mm -hmm. I've just figured out who that me is, um, a, a little bit more. And, and it is the, it's the things, it's the things that are at the center of who I am and who I've always been that are the things that I, I clung to maybe most, most strongly when I needed that, when I needed to remember who I was, when I needed to, to remember that I was more than just this stupid little collection of haywire cells, you know, hanging out in my right breast, you know what I mean? Like, um, I, <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, that is a really good question, Anissa. Um, I have not thought of it that way before, but yeah, I think we all are always who we are. Um, and the more we go through life with our eyes wide open and the more challenges we face, um, the more we come back to that core of who we've always been. Great, mm. great question. Thank you. I was, I was reminded a lot of, it. of this quote when um, I did a couple events with um, Annabelle Monahan, and she interestingly talked about that she feels like that we're our most authentic self when we're like nine years old, that, that that's when you're to, to, um, you don't know enough to, to, you know, to be afraid of some things. And so you'll go, you know, like you'll, you'll make the sand castle and allow the water to, you know, 
crash it down. But yet, you know, as you get older, you may, you may, not, you may look at it a little bit differently, but that, that when we're nine years older, and that to me says a lot about what you're saying too, you know, and, and I, and I know that we've talked about this about the core before. I think you've talked about it for a couple of years, if I remember correctly. And that's, I think, why I was so drawn to that statement. I think that um, um, I appreciated this book more well, that, that's probably not, I've, this, this became my favorite Kristen Harmel book Thanks. very quickly. And, and that says a lot. Cause I mean, I love your books, but I think that, um, I heard your voice very differently in this book. And I mean, I know this was written pre, pre any cancer diagnosis. So I know that has, has nothing to do with, but just, and just in talking with people too, when you were on tour at a couple of the events that I was able to go to, um, a lot of people were saying that it quickly became their favorite oh, book too. You. So um, that's so nice. Thank you. Well, you know, um, I, I was actually thinking as you were talking, you know, what I was saying earlier about Elise and Jack having known each other when they were younger. And um, it was kind of like what you were saying about being nine. Like they were, I mean, not that they were nine then, but um, yeah. but like life got in the way and she let the things that she thought she was supposed to be shape her. And she was only happy again when she, or, you know, only found the road to happiness again when she came back to who she had been all along, which I think a version of her, it was a version of what she had been in the 1930s before she went to Paris in the first place. So I think that um, the quote you brought up and, and then everything you just mentioned, I think fit very nicely with, with that story that we mentioned before too. Yeah, I think sometimes we strive mm -hmm. again, you know, if we're going to be our, be our best self, we're, we're going to go back to where we were meant to be. I mean, and we were meant to be there from, you know, from the beginning. And I think you allowed a lot of your characters to, to do, to, to do and to be where, where, where they needed to, needed to be. Thank you. You know, I also think that when the hard times come, like can as cancer diagnosis or like what happens to the characters in the book, it kind of crystallizes what's important. And I think that returns you back to who you were meant to be also. Like you might get, a, you know, like, like I, like I cared less this time around. I mean, I still cared, but I cared less this time around about what my numbers looked like, uh, like my, my sales numbers, you know, like I, I, I was mm -hmm. still obsessed. I'm not saying that I didn't <laughs> obsess about it and, you know, sit there all day Wednesday with knots in my, the, the Wednesday of the New York times list coming out with knots in my stomach, <laughs> but it was a different feeling this time because I, I had been through something that taught me that while that is important and while it feels important, it would have been a small victory or a small failure, not one that defined me. And so I think maybe that's again, part of you. I, I think a difficult time teaches you what's important and what's not. And that's part of returning to your core. So yeah. Thanks for making me think deep thoughts in these. Yeah. I actually, thanks I actually, for saw, oh. yeah, I actually saw Fiona the day afterwards, you know, she, she flew to Greenville the next day and she, she, she told me how, how excited she was that she, she uh, was, that was there. Sweet. And then I saw Nicola just last week and she said the same thing that, oh, that's awesome. that it was just so special for them to have been oh. there with you when you got that call. Well, it was special to me too. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Thank, Thank you for joining us, Anissa. Thank you so nice much, Anissa. You. You're welcome. We'll Take see care. See you all too. See y'all soon. Bye. Bye. Oh. It Our book nice. guru. Always good to see her. Yep. <laughs> I can't believe it's seven fifty three. I know. Well, that's because I, I talk too much. <laughs> no, no, just, no. But there's. I mean, I feel like we could go on for hours. <laughs> I this book was so amazing. Question, I'm sorry. I have to get this question in. We've had sure. several members ask this, and I think they will be mad at me. <laughs> um. <laughs> We've had several members ask, what made you choose to include the plane crash into Ooh. the story? I am glad you asked that because there was something I was going to mention about the plane crash. And now I am looking through um, to find what I was going to say to you. Okay, so um, what made me decide to include the plane crash? I knew I wanted to move forward in time to around 1960. It could have been 1959. It could have been 1962. I knew that was approximately the... Um, the amount of time I wanted to move forward because I wanted to see I wanted to see our characters when they'd had years to deal with their grief but not so many years that like they had lived a life in between right like my a lot of my previous books you've had characters in the 1940s and then you've had characters in the present day or in the 19 
90s or, you know, like where like an entire lifetime has elapsed. I wanted to see them when they were still relatively young, when they still had a whole bunch of life in front of them in theory. Um, and, and, um, and, and kind of see where they were. It was just kind of a different challenge to me. So when I knew approximately how far I wanted to move forward in time, um, I just began doing research about things that had happened. And I, I wanted to be in New York too. I, I just liked the idea of it being Paris and New York. And that seemed like a logical place, um, especially for Elise to have gone back to in a place she would go if you were returning to America from Paris and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and in my research, I found the story of this plane crash. Um, which just felt like it fit perfectly. I liked the idea sort of in that, um, if you've ever seen that movie, um, Final Destination, which is like about, I think there, I think if I, it's been so long, but um, I think in that movie, the people were, were like, like they missed being on a plane that crashed, if I'm remembering the plot correctly. It was something of, like that. It was something yeah. like that. But then like each of them dies one by one because they were meant to be on that plane or something. I, I don't, yeah. I, I'm probably getting the premise wrong. It's probably been 20 years since I've seen it. But to me, the idea of this was similar that like that Juliet sort of cheated what fate had in store for her um, all those years before. And in a way there was something poetic about um about you know it, it was it was planes dropping things from the sky and here here 15 years later for 16 years later and a continent away was a plane falling from the sky and it was also just that idea of you never know like you just never know I mean that it was like what an insane completely wild thing to happen but I'm glad that you asked about that because I wanted to tell you something that it just happened the other day. So, um, so I, I think I've probably shared you the, this with you before, but in all of my books, there's always a minor character named after Anne Frank. There's like the name Anne or the last name Frank or Anne or some version of Anne, like Annie or whatever. And then there's always somebody named after um, my childhood best friend, Jay Cash, whose name was James Franklin Cash the Third. So like in one of my books, there's the James Franklin Cash the Third elementary school, like whatever. I think in this um, in this book, I think there's an artist who's mentioned who you never see, but there's an artist whose name is like Anne Cash or James Frank or so, something like that. It's some combination of those two names. So anyhow, Jay Cash was my was my childhood best friend. We lived right across the street from each other. He died in a car accident 20 years ago. Um, I'm still really close to his mom. And at side note, his mom, Pat, actually came. She still lives in Columbus, which is where I lived when I was a kid, where Jay and I both lived. She actually came to our Friends in Fiction um, event in Columbus. And so she got to meet the other oh, girls nice. and they got to meet her, which was really nice. I'm still oh. very close with her. But she just finished reading The Paris Daughter last week and she called me and there have been a couple of like really weird overlaps lately where like I've written something and she's called to be like, did you know that Jay like blah, blah, blah. Like I've written stuff about like that weirdly like circled around stuff that has happened in her life that anyways, so she called last week and said, I just read your book and I had to call you immediately because the plane crash you wrote about. So, you know, in, in the author's note, I talk about the little boy named Stephen Baltz, who was the one survivor of that plane crash. He was an eight-year-old boy from Chicago. He, um, he lived through the plane crash, but then he died a day later in the hospital of his burns. It was a, ho a horrible uh -huh. story. Poor little guy. I mean, uh, awful, just heartbreaking. But I wrote about that. I wrote about this little boy in the author's note. She called to tell me, did you know that I went to high, did, or did you know that I went to school with Stephen Baltz? Did you know I knew him? And I was like, no. So she had been, um, she had been in a class with his sister and her older brother, who was a year, a year older than her had been in class with Steven. So they, they knew, they knew the Baltz family. And she remembered very clearly that happening as you would, if, if you're, you know, if your classmate, if your classmate yeah. died in a horrific plane crash. So um, that was actually a, a piece of her life and her past that I had no idea about. And I'd randomly chosen this story wow. um, that connected back to her past. So uh, to me, it was just, I don't know, life, life is mysterious and weird and connects us all back in ways we couldn't have expected. And to me, that was just, it, it gave me goosebumps. And I thought, just I have scared. goosebumps. Yeah. yeah. I know yeah. me too. What are the odds. Yeah. Oh my yep. goodness. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. That is amazing. Um, 
I have another question. We're not going to try to keep you too much longer, but I, I thought this was a really good question and I've never, well, it's a comment and a question. Mercedes says, Kristen, thank you so much for writing this deeply heartfelt story. I continue to learn from your book so much about World War II and its profound post-war effect on so many lives. You really capture the essence of different ways people choose to cope with their grieving process. The way you brought final peace to Juliet's soul was so creative and beautiful. I could go on and on about how skillfully you developed oh, all the you. characters. How nice. Of course, you deserve a five-star review and more. Mm -hmm. So what components are important to you to include when we are writing a review for Goodreads, for Amazon, et cetera? Gosh, what a nice question. And well, a nice compliment. And then a very good question. Um, what components are important to me? Um, it's, it's hard to say. I think the reviews that I appreciate the most as a writer, as the writer of the book are the ones that say exactly what she just said, like something about, um, the impact that it had on the reader or, um, or something. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I am, I, I feel proud of the way that I, I tried to explore grief in this novel. So I think that if you pull something out in a review, that's something that like, I'm proud that I put in there, those reviews are maybe the most meaningful. So like that actually, whatever she just said, that would be the perfect review. Um, I, I think as a reader, I, I like it, like as a reader, looking at Goodreads reviews myself, just, you know, from the outside looking in, I like reviews that pull out something like that too. Cause I, I feel like I can get the description of the book from reading, you know, just the blurb from the publisher, which, you know, they've put a lot of thought into and is designed to sort of capture the, the, the plot of the book. But I think when you can nail down the essence of the book, like not what the book was about, but like how the book made you feel or what you took away from it, or like what the themes were like, to me, those are the things that are, um, that are most helpful in a review. And then I think as a writer, if you, if, if a reviewer has gotten that right, you feel such a sense of, um, gratitude for, um, a, a gratitude that your work has been received in the way you intended, if that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> and all of your books are five stars. Thanks. So thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. We needed to get that in there for sure. Thank you. Oh, that's very <laughs> sweet. <laughs> I'm sure there are people but out there who would disagree, who would who have posted in uh, their disagreement, <laughs> but thanks. I'll take it. <laughs> oh my you're goodness. Awesome. You're awesome. Keep that shit up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <Exactly. laughs> um, am I gonna have to bleep you? <laughs> beginning oh, and ending goodness. with silliness yes. well Kristen we know <laughs> we've kept you a little bit extra but we didn't want you to leave without letting us know what you're currently working on what you have coming up because we always like to have the scoop well, you know, um, I am way behind on my next book it should have been due in April but um, I was you know doing chemotherapy in April uh, or not in April, but through, through the time I should have been writing the book. So I'm way behind. My deadline got moved to the end of January. Um, I should be further along on it than I am. Um, I'm not. So let's hope that my editor is not watching this. Um, this, you know, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, I, I will have it in on time. I always do. Um, it is, um, I, I think I've mentioned it briefly before, and I will probably only mention it briefly now because it's hard for me to talk about a book before I've really gotten that far into writing it because I know the plot points, but they seem like a weird collection at this point that mm. don't they, that, like they don't really fit together. And to me, the biggest thing about talking about a book is being able to know what the theme is. And I, I don't know the theme yet. Like I, I just don't until I start getting to know the characters and where the book is going. But um, it's a story about a woman um, who is a jewel thief in, uh, in World War II Paris. She comes from a long tradition of jewel thieves. They're kind of like Robin Hood. They steal not just from the rich, but from the rich and evil or just the evil, um, which in World War II Paris, spoiler alert, would be the Germans. Um, and so she has made quite the career out of following her family tradition um, and taking jewels from Germans and um, German sympathizers 
and redistributing them to the French resistance, um, which is good work uh, as long as the Germans um, are not on to you. Um, she is betrayed. Um, she is arrested. And the night that she is arrested, uh, a police officer comes to the window and takes one of her two daughters away. Um, it is in the melee of like the arrest happening and all of that. So one of her daughters disappears. The other one is taken with her um, to be sent away uh, to be deported along with her husband also. And she bribes a guard to let the one daughter and the husband out. Um, and the other daughter now has disappeared. And I also have to tell you that each of the daughters has um, a piece of jewelry sewn into the lining of the nightgowns they were wearing this night because she's always had a piece of jewelry sewn into the nightgown lining so that if anything ever happened to them, um, they would always have something of value to be able to, you know, I don't know, whatever, it would help to have something of value. So that is the story that's in the past. And as that story slowly unfolds and we see what happens to her and we see what happens to the daughter um, who stayed with her and was released, um, we also see that daughter in the modern day. And it might be like 10 years ago, but like now-ish, right? I just have to figure out if the math works. Um, and she is now an older woman who... Um, who uh, has spent her whole life um, not knowing what happened to her sister and blaming herself for letting the policeman take her sister away. And one day um, she sees in an ad for a jewelry exhibit at a museum, um, a picture of the bracelet that was sewn into the lining of her sister's dress the night that her sister disappeared. And she realizes that if she can figure out where this bra bracelet came from and where it's been all these years, she might find out what happened to her sister. Um, and because she was also raised by the brother of her mother, who was also part of this tradition of jewel thieves, she too is a jewel thief. And she might just have to steal the bracelet back. <laughs> so those oh. are like my, <laughs> those are like my little like some of my plot points but yeah that's what it's about you already wow. have your elevator pitch like, no that was I like know. no that was probably more than I knew about the novel when I started talking to you so thanks for letting me work through some of that in my own head we're Just here play for you whenever you need <laughs> Kristen we oh. love you so much and thank you so much for joining us tonight it has so been much. such a great discussion we could yes. talk to you all night long well I feel the same uh, <laughs> this is fun <laughs> yes we love you and we love oh, this book it you. is just thank you so much. amazing thank you it's just amazing thank you guys I really appreciate it well I mean it's kind of awesome but I'm gonna keep this shit up <laughs> you had to do it <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny well thank you so much thank and you, you thank you Kristen thanks for having Enjoy. me and thanks for all the great work you guys are doing this is amazing Aww. the community you're building is amazing and um I am so grateful to you we're all so grateful to the two of you so thank you oh thank you thank you thank so much you. thank you have a good wonderful night. rest of the evening good night take care Oh, oh my what goodness. A nice. How what a way to end, right? I know. I just I loved this book so I mean I did you too. know people always ask, you know, who's the author that you read where you can just pick it up and you don't put it down? And I always say Kristen Harmel. Usually I always just say the book of lost names, like that one. I picked it up. <laughs> I was just gonna read a little bit. Read the whole thing straight through. Only went to go to the bathroom. Didn't eat. Didn't do anything. And this book was the same way. Um, Source of Vanishing Stars was the same way. You know, Sweetness of Forgetting. Like, you know. Um, I'm just so glad we were able to have that discussion with her. But oh, me too. We did run over a little bit. So now we're in the after after show. So thank you. For That's right. Me. We didn't get to make any, um, you know any of our announcements but we'll do that yeah. we'll do that here in just a minute but it was just I feel like I could talk to her for hours and ask her question after question about this book because it was so I don't know the characters especially in this book always in her books but especially in this book were so real and their struggles yeah. were so real and their burdens were so real 
that oh, yeah. it was just anyway <laughs> i had chill yeah. bumps any number of times tonight mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah for sure well i um, did want to mention a couple of things or lisa if you would like to to no i want to hear your voice <laughs> okay okay well i wanted to uh tell everyone to make sure to, to tune sure. in on july 25th just a week away uh a weekend yeah. day at 6 p.m for our third anniversary bash i cannot believe it has been three years of the friends and three Fiction official years. Book club three years and nineteen thousand members yay and, and we're going to have the Fab Four with us that night, and we're going to have giveaways, and Brenda and I have a very special announcement we will be making that night. So mm -hmm. it's going to be awesome, so make sure you join us. And it's at 6 p.m. Eastern. Normally everything's at 7, but this time it is at 6 p.m. Eastern on the 25th. So mark your calendars and you'll probably get a few reminders throughout the week. So make sure you check our page. Yes, there may be some there may be some reminders during the week. Absolutely. Well, I also starting wanted tomorrow. to mention. Yeah, starting tomorrow. <laughs> um, I also wanted to mention our our um, happy hour with Ron Block on Friday not Thursday, but Friday, August 18th at 7 p.m. Eastern. Yes. It's always a fun night having happy hour with Ron. There's wonderful book recommendations and silliness and games and just Cocktails lots of great and book talks. <laughs> <laughs> yes how could I forget cocktails and mocktails and our next book discussion will be August 20 well I might have that date wrong uh with Christy Woodson Harvey and the secret of the secret the summer of songbirds <laughs> just getting yep. tongue tied tonight Lisa <laughs> you said August 21st right I think that that's right oh that's right okay yeah, yeah. I just had this sudden fear that that was not <laughs> the right date. I mean, there we just have a lot of, there's a lot of dates going on. We have <laughs> a lot of dates. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. And I'm still kind of reeling over that just amazing information from Kristen too. She's so yeah. quotable. I mean, what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> it's just a great night great discussion and thank you guys for hanging out with us we love you guys we appreciate you and we just can't wait till next week so we I'm... hope you join us live on the 25th it's gonna be a lot of fun and i hope not to cry cry last year you know i really can't see that <laughs> not happening <laughs> Just frankly, we'll more. I think we'll laugh more. I'm sure we will, but I think there might be some of that too. But uh, happy reading, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the evening. And I'll leave it to Lisa to sign us out. PB and J out. Good night, night everybody. <laughs>